Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. This is Mary Guzman, founder and CEO of Crown Jewel Insurance, and I'm very excited to have with me some distinct members of the trade secret risk management community, experts in their field. And the three of us are here today to share with you what we are doing at Crown Jewel Insurance, which is building a consortium of products and services surrounding the risk management process for trade secret insurance. Um, and just mitigating and defending trade secrets in general. Um, I'm going to let Mark and Phil introduce themselves quickly, and then we'll get started. Mark, go ahead. Well, um, many of you know me. I, I have uh, uh, taught advanced trade secrets law at John Marshall Law School. I think I'm in my 26th year. I have uh, devoted most of my legal career to trade secrets uh, and tr uh, the identification of trade secrets and trade secret asset management and this is the and and this new uh uh trade secret insurance and and this consortium that I've been very pleased and proud to be part of I think is the, is going to be the next revolution in intellectual property law so very pleased to be part of this webinar today Phil Hi, Phil Antoon. I'm a managing director with Alvarez and Marceau, and I specialize in providing valuations of intangible assets, intellectual property, and overall corporations. And I've spent a good part of my 30 plus year career valuing intangible assets, including trade secrets. And I've conducted these valuations of trade secrets for a variety of purposes, ranging from um, tax planning and reporting, financial reporting, uh, lending purposes. So I will be chatting today about uh, how and why we value trade, trade seek and the rationale for support for full valuation. Thanks, Phil. And before we jump into the presentation, I just wanted to remind everyone that we are scheduled to, to speak for roughly an hour and go through each of our um, presentations here, and then we're saving 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Uh, we're starting to get several questions um, that have common themes running through them, so we'll share frequently asked questions, three or four of those, and then we'll, we'll try to take two or three from the group as we go along here, so be sure to send those in. And if we don't have time to get to all of your questions today, we will record a, another video answering all of the questions that came in through the Q&A and post that to our YouTube channel um, here shortly. With that, Mark, I'll turn it over to you to, to tell us what a trade secret is. Well, the starting point of all of trade secrets law is the it analysis. What is it that you are alleging to be a trade secret? Uh, in today's modern definition of a trade secret, a trade secret protects any information technical or non-technical information, all the way from the spectrum of secret formulas to marketing customer lists, the entire gamut. It protects negative know-how. What doesn't work? In my career in litigating trade secret cases, often that's some of the most valuable trade secret information. It's the negative know-how. It's the failed experiments. And then also trade secrets law encompasses public elements that are uniquely combined, what we call the combination analysis. So to give you an example of, of, you know, what are the descriptors for trade secrets, you can start with the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. And in the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, trade secret is defined to mean information, any information, including a formula, pattern, compilation, program, device, method, technique, or process that derives independent economic value, actual or potential, from not being generally known to and not being readily ascertainable by proper means and is the subject of efforts that are reasonable under the circumstances to maintain its secrecy. Then you can look at the definition of a trade secret uh, in the Restatement Third of Unfair Competition in 1995. Definition of a trade secret. A trade secret is any information that can be used in the operation of a business or other enterprise, and that is sufficiently valuable and secret to afford an actual or potential economic advantage over others. And finally, we have the Economic Espionage Act of 1996, which is now the repository for the Defend Trade Secrets Act of 2016. 
And this statutory definition, the term trade secret means all forms and types of financial, business, scientific, technical, economic, or engineering information, including patterns, plans, compilations, program devices, formulas, designs, prototypes, methods, techniques, processes, procedures, uh, programs or codes, whether tangible or intangible, and whether or how stored, compiled, or memorialized physically, electronically, graphically, photographically, or in writing. So the point is, is that you have this entire gamut and this entire universe of any information in order to identify your critical assets, your trade secret assets. Terrific. Um, and one of the things that we certainly wanted to get across to the folks that are listening today, um, certainly those of you that are like me and you've spent most of your career on the insurance side of the equation, I've um, failed to mention that I spent 30 years as a broker before I jumped ship to go try to do this endeavor that's near and dear to my heart. Um, you may not understand kind of what's going on in the environment and why trade secrets have become so important, which is, leads us to the next point of the discussion. Um, and that, that is that the trade secret environment in the United States has really dramatically shifted over the last couple of years. And there are several reasons why that's the case. Uh, the first is, as Mark mentioned, that until 2016, when the DTSA was passed, the Defend Trade Secrets Act, there was little protection at the federal level for enforcement of trade secret misappropriation, except under the criminal code. Um, and therefore, uh, organizations would typically choose to go some other route in terms of protecting their designs, formulas, et cetera, um, because they were difficult to defend and enforce. Secondly, at the same time, the Patent Office, the USPTO, has made it more difficult as we move along into a more digital or gig economy um, for organizations to get their patent filings approved, certainly because there are more, um, there's more sharing of you know, software code and it's very easy to potentially you know, use other people's software code, but also business processes are uh, becoming more of what is a differentiator between you and your competition in terms of making you better, faster, stronger, and business processes have always been very difficult to get approved from a patent perspective. Um, and at the same time, there are certain industries like the chemical um, industry, for example, that by for strategy purposes, uh, for strategic reasons, typically doesn't file for patents. And if you think about any intellectual property asset that somewhere along the uh, spectrum of somewhere in the R&D phase, you may not even realize that it's become valuable over a period of three or four years if it's not sitting in your R&D department and it's just become a better and better process or a way to do something. Um, organizations up until they decide whether to file something as a patent are sitting on a treasure trove potentially of trade secrets and they don't even realize it. Um, most organizations today realize the importance of trade secrets. In a survey that was done actually a couple of years ago now by Baker and McKenzie back in 2017, um, it became clear, and I'm, I'm guessing if they were to redo this um, survey today, the numbers would be even higher, but senior executives recognize, 80% of them recognize that trade secrets are critical to their business, and 69% foresee trade secrets becoming more critical than any other type of intellectual property. Over 60% say that trade secret protection is a board level issue, yet the really interesting thing about it is that there is no current insurance protection. Um, which is really the crux of why we started this business at Crown Jewel Insurance. Um, in my personal, you know, professional career in the last five years or so, we really, I think, nailed, nailed the cyber coverage and had a very good response for our clients when it came to privacy and the disclosure of personally identifiable information and business interruption losses related to um, downtime and, and those types of things. And so the cyber market 
had matured, but the one area that was still kind of a, um, a gaping hole, if you will, in the insurance response to the changing environment, the digital environment in particular around IP was that the policies don't cover the first party value of trade secrets against theft or misappropriation. And so we sought out to change that, to make it so that we could build a market and build services to support the insurance product so that the underwriters would feel more comfortable that the trade secrets they're insuring have, have the proper security around them, have a defensible valuation around them, that we know how to go after a misappropriator once we know who that person or company is, and that we have a mechanism in place to do that. And so that is really what all of this culminates in, is we want to help innovative companies um, that are developing new technologies that could change the world by providing an insurance backstop for them if somebody compromises those assets. So that's what we're about. Mary, it's Phil, if I could just make a quick observation. Yes. And around the importance of trade secrets, and this really speaks to intangible asset value in general. If you go back in time, and you look at a public stock value of a company, and then you compare that total value to the, to the balance sheet. What you'll find is back in time, there really wasn't much value ascribed to companies, even on the public market, above and beyond the value of their tangible assets. As we progressed through, so as, you, as we started to hit the, 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 the late 90s and, and moving on, I mean, if you look today, if you go to many companies, most companies, you have a sizable difference between the public market value and the value that's on the balance sheet. And really, what's changed over time, it's the recognition of the value attributable to intangible assets, including trade secrets. So to, to Mary's point earlier about pointing out chemical companies where they don't like to patent their the processes, they like to keep them proprietary. If you look at, at a company in that industry and you did that quick math and saw this, this, this big difference between the fair market value and net book value, that's being driven in part by trade secrets. So I think it's, it, and, and I'll, I'll touch upon this later, but I just wanted to interject now as we talked about the importance of trade secrets to really highlight that the market does reflect and does capture and does recognize the importance of trade secrets and there, therefore essentially is very comfortable putting a dollar value to it. So as we move through the process and talk about value, I, it's, it's important to keep front of mind that trade secrets are, it's an asset that is valued all the time and, and really is captured in, in public market pricing. That is a fantastic point, and actually it leads to my next, my next um, point that I wanted to make, which is back to the importance, Phil, of you and your team and what you guys do. Really, as we talked about and talked about and talked about how to cover or try to cover the intrinsic value of trade secrets against misappropriation or other compromise in the cyber market over the years, um, it was a topic at every conference. You know, how do we how do we help our clients? Um, you know, figure out how to cover. You know, what's hidden on their computers somewhere um, that is potentially provides way more valuable value to them than their tangible assets, their desks and their actual computers and their buildings that most likely they don't own. Um, and the prob the biggest challenge that we ran into in general was valuation. It was seen as very subjective, hard to agree upon, hard to get insurers to um, not take a header, but m more um, take a, a reasonable risk um, that they could insure the value of those trade secrets on the basis of a third party, you know, determined and agreed upon value so that on the back end, we, we would not have trouble adjusting those claims and having everybody argue after the fact that even though we valued a, an asset at X when the policy incepted, when the, when the loss was discovered, you know, two years later, 
it really hadn't come to fruition the way the insurer thought it would, and they didn't gain near as much market share. Well, we, we're addressing all of that in this process, which, which will come out a little bit further. But it does talk about one of the most important gaps in the IP risk management strategy that most organizations are facing today. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about formal risk management process and strategy in a second. Um, but the fact of the matter is that even though the market recognizes and most senior leadership and board members and other stakeholders like investors recognize that intellectual property or intangible assets have a lot of value, unless something is patented or unless it's a trade secret asset that they paid a market price for during a recent acquisition, what we're finding is that most companies don't put an individual value on an individual trade secret asset, which was shocking to me, fr frankly, when I went into this process. But I think um, what we've discovered is there are a lot of reasons why. Um, the trade secrets gain a lot of value over time, and they kind of sneak up on you, if you will. Um, you might be, you know, developing processes, process improvement, you know, methodologies internally that make your um, the ability to load and move your product around faster, better than your competition, which of course saves you time and money. Um, and all of a sudden, you've got yourself a nice little trade secret that you've spent, you know, three years developing and perfecting that you maybe didn't put a dollar value on. Um, you also don't have a piece of paper or, you know, some sort of formal attribution or confirmation that some from a third party that something is a trade secret, like you do if you file um, for other formal types of intellectual property protection. Um, and you know, unless you're trying to license or sell that technology, there, there may not be a, a need or the understanding that there's a need to value that asset. And frankly, it takes a lot of work, a lot of work um, until now, which we'll get to in a moment, um, to uh, around everything else that you have to do related to your intellectual property assets and all of the things you have to juggle from an enterprise risk management standpoint to implement a formal valuation and trade secret asset management program is time consuming um, and it just sort of goes by the wayside, I think, internally with competing priorities. And then perhaps the most important reason is that up until now, you couldn't ensure the value of trade secrets against misappropriation. Um, there is insurance for, you know, potentially um, enforcement of your rights, you know, which becomes a litigation issue as opposed to a just a first party payment. Um, but, you know, we're trying to change that. And then one huge thing, especially for some small to medium sized companies who are looking for better loan terms or additional funding from private equity or venture, venture capital investors, is that once you put a dollar value, a supportable dollar value on an asset, whether it's tangible or intangible, and then you can insure that asset, you might be able to use the proceeds of that insurance policy as collateral. Um, so that in and of itself is a reason to value your trade secrets and potentially insure them. So as we talked about, um, there is a, a kind of a formal process, insurance or risk management 101, um, that is, is necessary in any part of an enterprise risk management program, both in order to gain the support of the insurance industry, but also, this is just a Maryism. ism um, I would be surprised if three to five years from now we don't start seeing VCs and other, you know, investors, stakeholders on the financial side of the equation requiring um, sort of security around the value of IP assets if at the end of the day the IP assets or trade secrets of an organization are the real reason that they're buying or investing in a company, that underlying asset right now is not insured um, in, in most cases. And so, again, I think this could be a game changer going forward. So there are five steps in, a, in an IP risk management strategy just like any other strategy. And again, we found that a lot of companies have sort of for some reason or another put the IP risk management you know, to the side a little bit, but they, those steps are identification, classification, valuation slash quantification, risk mitigation, transfer, and then recovery. 
So as we go from here on out in the presentation, we've put them in that order and the processes, policies, procedures, and services that we're going to offer and include as part of this overall risk management offering that touches each one of those five steps. So again, our purpose here is to roll out something that we're calling Crown Jewel Protector. Drum roll, please. Crown Jewel Protector um, is a first of its kind turnkey risk management and risk transfer solution that is specifically focused on trade secrets misappropriation and theft. And we have therefore pre-bind solutions, you know, um, services that will be offered during the policy period. And then we have a, a potentially post-breach or post-loss services that we've built in. And we'll, we'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. The pre-bind offerings that are on the table here, uh, automated TSAM. And um, he and a couple of other brilliant people have developed a software tool called the Trade Secret Examiner that is an easy to use software platform um, that allows an organization to index and then it automatically scores and prioritizes how well an organization grades themselves, mind you, on um, either valuing a trade secret asset appropriately securing that trade secret asset and keeping it secret properly and, you know, whether or not it, they own that trade secret in the first place and are properly documenting that something is, in fact, perceived by the organization as a trade secret. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that and sort of that's the underpinning, the, lay, the bottom layer, if you will, and a really significant layer of what we're doing on the risk management side that helps us on the underwriting piece of things as well. The second pre-bind issue is that um, Phil and his team will come in and overlay their valuation capabilities around what the client has already provided um, to validate the value of the trade secrets that we're talking about and that we want to ensure. And then we're also going to do a high-level threat assessment using a questionnaire that is a supplement to but different from a regular kind of cyber insurance questionnaire that looks at how you're protecting data in general. This one is much anomalies and um, to see if any particular trade secret asset that we're covering has even come back in along with the folks at Fisher Broyles um, to help on the enforcement side if we, during the forensics and in, in investigation stage, can confirm and agree that a covered trade secret has been misappropriated or even and, and is out in the wild or we know who's got that trade secret, then we get more about this whole crown jewel protector program as we move through the slides. Uh, so let me, this is Mark, let me address for a moment automated trade secret asset management, TSAM. Some of you may have seen the article that I wrote in Landslide Magazine, the American Bar Association Landslide Magazine, um, in May, the May-June issue of 2019, uh, in, entitled uh, The Next Revolution in Intellectual Property Law, Automated Trade Secret Asset Management. And, and that article discusses the fact that there are four stages uh, in the life cycle of a trade secret or in the management of a trade secret uh, those, those, those four stages are identification, classification, protection, and valuation. And the beginning and ending point of all of trade secrets law, uh, and having read thousands of cases and studied the law, the beginning and ending point is the in analysis. What is it that you are alleging constitutes a trade secret? If you have an information asset, you're alleging it's a trade secret, you have to identify it. And then, because it, that's like boiling the ocean, you heard the modern definition of trade secrets, you have to have a way to classify and rank after identification. Now, finally, you can implement a, an effective protective regime. And once you've done all that, now you can value the trade secret asset. And that's, this is critical. Because the reason why trade secret asset management programs and audits and all that have failed 
they 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 start off with a big bang and they fail is because they started the protection stage uh, and they have all these policies and procedures and, and processes to protect but they don't know what they're protecting and it's doomed to fail sometimes quickly sometimes over time it is going to fail the, pe the fact is that the four stages cannot be juggled around identification precedes classification and identification and classification precedes protection and identification classification and protection precedes valuation and why are we doing this manually by by someone gets excited there's a key employee leave so everybody gets in a conference room to figure out what the trade secrets are that he or she may have taken and They've got Dunkin' Donuts and coffee, and they're essentially holding an ideation session, you know, to try to figure out what, what they're going to say the trade secrets are. That, that just cannot be the way a company runs uh, when 80% or more of their assets within the company are intangible assets. So use the power of the computer, and that's what the Trade Secret Examiner platform provides, an automated trade secret asset management system. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, since we're talking about the Trade Secret Examiner, um, to make sure everybody just functionally knows how it works, it's a software that can run on any platform, and it uses blockchain to make sure that the record cannot be uh, manipulated in any way, shape, or form, so that you've got that perfect record going into um, courts to try to push for whatever type of enforcement you are able to get on the back end, which Mark will talk about in a little bit more detail. And it supports the two major steps in successful trade secret litigation. And again, Mark's going to chat about these later um, using the litmus test and um, the Iona uh, proof. Um, what we're going to do regarding this, this platform is, is give it to everybody. Um, as part of our offering. So um, the cost of it will be borne by the insurance carriers, um, which is something that I think would be music to people's ears and, you know, that you'll be trained on how to use it. They have a very, very lengthy, um, in a good way, uh, user's manual that they can provide to people to get everybody up to speed on how to use it. But employees can fill out the information on a single trade secret asset and about the time it takes them to buy a plane ticket. So um, once the information, you know, you might have multiple employees putting in information around the same asset or the same set of assets, which make up a bigger trade secret, but um, it's, it's an easy to use platform with an internal scoring mechanism, which brings me to the next point, which is, as you know, as insurance, carriers, um, the market is not going to just um, sort of offer insurance on the basis of your own, you know, um, fox watching the hen house, your own evaluation of how you're doing from an information security standpoint, and um, frankly, you know, predetermining what you think the value of that trade secret will look like. So we're using A&M, even though people will give their best efforts to do that, you know, we, we need to have support that with additional documentation. So that's where A&M comes in on the valuation side. And then we'll also be using a threat assessment questionnaire and dark web monitoring as provided by X-Cyber. So you know, one of the keys to the trade secret asset management system and dovetails uh, so nicely with, with the, the Economic Espionage Act of 1996, which provides for ex-party seizure orders. Everything that goes into the automated trade secret asset management system uh, is blockchain. And blockchain, of course, uh, cannot be forensically challenged. And uh, so in an automated trade secret asset management system, we eliminate all the factual disputes that you ordinarily see in traditional trade secret litigation. Because if you get right down to it, what you do is you go into a courtroom and you put people under oath to testify about what they think the trade secret is. You put documents and evidence. It, it all plays out. But by blockchaining the evidence, you can walk right into record, right into court with the forensic evidence. It can't be forensically changed. I mean, the trade secret evidence can't be forensically challenged. I mean, this is a game changer. And so once, and and it's also important to understand that you are not touching the trade secrets. You are 
uh, not capturing trade secrets or anything like that. You're capturing metadata about the trade secret. And once the trade secret metadata is entered into the blockchain, there is no possibility that the records can be altered or, or falsified because with a blockchain system, you can only you cannot go backward. You, the blocks only go forward. And as you will see in some more detail, I think, when I focus on the EONA proofs, existence, ownership, notice, and access, those are requirements in, a, in litigation of a trade secrets case. You can do all of that ahead of time and have the evidence blockchain so you're ready to go right into court to get that ex parte seizure order. You can, it can instantly be proven by production of timestamp, blockchain, digital records or any date of interest in a trade secret misappropriation lawsuit. And everything that goes into the automated trade secret asset management system is blockchained and cannot be tampered or altered with. So, um, again, that's a key part of the system. Mark, just to add to that before we switch over to the valuation piece, I think one of the things that is critical to me and I think crit critical to the markets is where, as we continue to build a market for this, build capacity is that it used to it used to cost or in today's environment without the any way to automate this process potentially millions of dollars in legal fees um, to just to get to the point where you can do the enforcement or to instigate the enforcement on the back end and and, and get all those people in a room and spend hours um, invite you know interviewing different people um, and trying to prove that in fact a trade secret that you think was a trade secret was in fact a trade secret and that you had proper security around it and all of those things so it eliminates months of time and millions of dollars potentially in legal fees by automating this process and um, I think that's something that we want to make sure that that folks understand on the phone here the next part of the risk management process then is quantification. Thanks, Mary. So I, I, my goal here is not to teach everyone how to value a trade secret. It really is just to ensure that when everybody walks away from, um, from the call that they have a comfort level that there are supportable methodologies for valuing trade names, or trade, sorry, trade secrets, in that these are put into place every day. So, because that, to Mary's point earlier, we always get the question, can you even value a trade secret? So, in, and obviously, as we're talking about today, the answer is yes, and they are valued on a regular basis. And as I mentioned in my um, comments earlier, even if you look at publicly traded companies that obviously possess significant numbers of trade secrets, that value is, is being recognized in, in the public market. When companies are making acquisitions of, of businesses that possess trade secrets, they are paying for those trade secrets. If they weren't paying for those trade secrets, they would pretty much just go look at the, the net book value of the tangible assets of the company. But that's not what occurs um, in reality, companies are paying for the intangible assets, including the trade secrets. And as mentioned, we value trade secrets for a variety of purposes. And for example, we may conduct a valuation of a trade secret for tax purposes. Companies are frequently moving their intangible assets within their own legal entity uh, structures. When they do that, they have to ascribe a fair market value to the trade secret. And when that occurs, we will provide an independent fair market value. And there is always a possibility that a tax authority, the IRS, it could be a non-US tax authority, are going to come in and conduct a very detailed review of that valuation. So it, these are valuations that are not just put out there. These are valuations that essentially are uh, often reviewed by taxing authorities as well as by accounting firms for financial reporting purposes as part of their, their independent audit review process. So they go through very rigorous reviews on a, on a regular basis. So now I just want to talk about methodologies to valuing a trade secret. You have two, two possibilities with the trade secret. Possibility one is that 
it's helping to generate revenue. So you've got a product in the market that is driven in part by a trade secret, or you have a product or a process and a trade secret is enabling to, to essentially um, help to reduce the costs or help to increase the revenues, provide the pricing premium, whatever it may be, there is some attributable cash flow stream um, generated by that trade secret. The other bucket is we're not yet generating revenues. We've got a trade secret. We know it's valuable. Somebody would love to have it, but we're pre-revenue. Does that mean there's no value? There is value. So if you have a trade secret that's pre-revenue, it does not mean there's zero value. So in the next few slides, I'm going to chat about how we value trade secrets, where we can attribute some revenue stream to it or some, some type of income stream to it. And I'll also chat about the situations where we don't have an income or revenue stream and, and how we go about capturing value. So there are essentially a few different ways to value trade secrets utilizing an income approach. And an income approach basically, regardless of what type of approach you're using, pretty much says, how much income can I generate from this trade secret or in part from the use of this trade secret? Or how much can I save by utilizing this trade secret? And in a simplistic view, you're looking at the future income generating capability attributable in part to the trade secret, and you're calculating the present value of that future income stream back to today. It's very similar to, if anybody's seen, a discounted cash flow of an overall company. It, essentially, that's what you're looking at, but you're modifying the approach to a trade name. Trade secret, sorry. I, we value trade names all the time as well. So I've listed three here, multi-period excess earnings method, relief from royalty method, and with and without method. And I'm going to go to the, uh, in the, in the next slide, we talk about, about just a little bit of detail of each of those three methodologies. So the multi-period excess earnings method, the MP, essentially what this method does is it, it's really useful for a situation where a trade secret is the primary intangible asset of the business. And the approach says we have, we're generating an operating profit from the business we're going to basically say, here's my total operating profit, and I have other assets in the business. I have working capital. I, have, uh, I may have property plant and equipment, and you're, I have employees. You're essentially taking and applying charges for the use of those other assets. Really similar to saying I'd have to go out and, and lease um, my fixed assets, or I'd have to lease another intangible asset. And what you're doing is taking those charges, those expenses attributable to those other assets, and deducting those from your operating profit. And what you're left with is essentially a cash flow stream that's attributable to the trade secret. And you're looking at that cash flow stream over the life of the trade secret. Some trade secrets have a short life, some have a very long life. And at the end of the day, without getting into all the, the, the details, you're able to take those excess earnings, as we call them, take an after-tax um, amount, and bring that back to today. And what you're left with, essentially, is the fair market value of the trade secret. The a second approach, relief from royalty. This is a common approach for licensable assets. Think about patent technology. Think about trade names. The same goes with trade secrets. Companies are regularly licensing out or in intellectual property assets. Whether they're licensing in a brand name or a patent or a trade secret. And essentially what it's saying is the value of a trade secret can be connected to the license rate that a third party is willing to pay for the use of that trade secret. I'm willing to pay you, or I'm willing to take 5% of your revenues and you can utilize my trade secret. 
And again, it's a relief from royalty, and it's the same premise as the MP, and that you're looking at, at those license payments and bringing those back to today at some risk-adjusted discount rate. Another approach we can use is called a with and without. It's basically looking at the cash flows of the business with the trade secret in place. So it's essentially saying, here's where I am today, here's where I'm expecting to go into the future. Let me look at my cash flows in the future. Then you have a second scenario that says, well, what would my business look like if I didn't have these trade secrets? And all of a sudden, I'm going to have lower cash flows. So you're looking at that second scenario and you're recasting your cash flows, essentially looking at the effect without the use of the trade secret. The difference in the cash flows between those two scenarios essentially pinpoints the cash flows attributable to the trade secret. And again, we can go back to doing a present value calculation of of those incremental cash flows. There's no one size fits all, and we try to look at as many different approaches as possible. We go in, we look at the nature of the trade secret, we look at the nature of the business, we look at available information, and again, whenever we have a business where projected financial information is available, the the, the best method for valuing a trade secret is looking at the future income generating capability of that asset. Some people ask me, well, why can't you use a cost approach to value a trade secret if they're generating income? The reason is that the trade secret has developed value well above the cost that were put in to develop that trade secret. If they use a cost approach when you're generating income already based in part on a trade secret, you are going to undervalue the trade secret. Which brings me to my um, my next um, example, cost approach. We deal frequently with companies that have trade secrets but have not gen- generated any type of revenue. At that point, there's value. What we're looking at are a, a couple of items. We're looking at what were the total costs expended to date in bringing the trade secret to its current position. Important point. We're looking at costs that were expended on wrong turns. Because the premise is, if somebody came in to buy the the trade secret to where it's at to date, essentially, they're going to benefit from not having to take those wrong turns. If they try to replicate the effort, they're going to make wrong turns. So there's a, a good argument that the owner of the trade secret should be compensated for the fact that they took those wrong turns, but it led them down the appropriate path. Now, people may want to argue, do you include all those costs? There's always a little bit of a gray area there, but must keep in, it must take into consideration the fact that all those costs should initially be considered. From yeah. there, it's a function of, oh, that. Yeah, Philip, that's what I was, when I talked about the protection of negative know-how as a trade secret. Uh, what, what doesn't work, you know, uh, is often, uh, as valuable as what the solution was. All the time, effort, and money, to, and all the blind alleys and all the wrong turns is is often very critical. The WD-40 exactly. formula, the first 39 experiments failed, but water displacement experiment 40 uh, worked. And, and to this day, they have a monopoly on that, um, in that formula. Exactly. So Mark's point dovetails directly into how we view and capture value of a trade secret. It's that those wrong turns do actually add value. So now you've gathered all the costs expended. You, you apply to those costs to that time some uh, fully loaded blended hourly rate, and you can apply that to the number of hours that have been expended to develop the, the trade secret to date. Also at that point, you don't want to sell the trade secret just at that price because there's a return. So the trade secret has value above and beyond the costs that were expended. There is value associated with the fact that um, there should be some type of profit and return on top of the cost. There's a time, there's a time to market. If, uh, if, if somebody else tried to replicate what was done already, even if they could, 
it's going to put them X number of years behind entry into the market. If they come in and buy the trade secret today, they're that much closer to market entry. Thus, you need to apply some reasonable return on top of the cost expense. And again, this is an approach we use frequently for companies that either are pre-revenue or just can't put pen to paper yet. Maybe they're generating a little bit of revenue, but can't put pen to paper on the future income generating capabilities. So for me, that's it. In conclusion on the valuation, we, we value trade secrets all the time. There are methodologies that have been in place for, for, for many, many years, and, um, and, and we're very comfortable ascribing value to trade secrets for this specific purpose. Great. Thank you, Phil. Um, the next part of the discussion, we're moving into mitigation now, and I'm only going to spend a second on this because we talked about this a little bit earlier. Obviously, loss prevention, um, risk control, mitigation, those are all synonymous terms that we use in the insurance industry all the time to describe, you know, policies and procedures that you're using to prevent a risk from happening in the first place or to keep it from being as ugly as it otherwise could be. Um, you could say that the entire world is in risk mitigation mode at the moment um, or maybe past that, and it's... Um, it's scary what we're all dealing with, but um, you know, this is what we're trying to do now is put the genie back in the bottle a little bit, um, and you know, unfortunately, maybe with some better better planning up front, um, we wouldn't be in the horrifying situation that we are now, or at least not in as, as deep a water as we are now. And that's really what the risk mitigation what risk mitigation is about. Um, so when we think about that in terms of pr protecting trade secret assets, um, there are lots of different tools in your toolbox that you're already that companies are already using. So we're not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that companies are just oblivious to the fact that they have trade secrets within their organizations and that they're not doing anything to protect them. It's just that what we find is that maybe they haven't structured that process as formally as they might have for other types of tangible assets or personally identifiable data because there's so much regulatory action around that data that there's an obligation to do that. Um, at any rate, what we want to do is help organizations formalize and you know, um, create a strategy around the mitigation so that it's easier for them to identify internally what their most valuable assets are what they're already doing to protect them, and is it enough? Um, and as part of that, we will be using a risk assessment questionnaire that will supplement what was already completed for a traditional cyber placement, assuming that the company already buys a, a traditional cyber policy. If not, that's easy enough for us to deal with. Um, but that really looks at how trade secrets should be protected in a different way then you would protect reg regular digital assets um, and recognizing that you could have a compromise that doesn't have anything to do with a computer. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but we are really mainly focusing on mitigation strategies around technology and information security risk. Um, the second thing that we're doing, and so we're going to be evaluating and, and making suggestions around what companies are already doing from a risk assessment standpoint, we're going to be, supplementing that with dark web monitoring, uh, as we discussed earlier, provided by X-Cyber. And then to help us on the back end, um, we're going to invoke the services of not only X-Cyber on the forensics um, and business continuity side of things, but the folks at Fisher Broyles, Mark and his team on the um, moving quickly to get an ex parte seizure order and try to recapture those assets before they've been compromised to a point of no return, essentially, and or to go after that third party to establish and seek damages, uh, which we'll talk about in just a moment as part of the insurance policy. Now we get to the risk transfer uh, section of the risk management process that we're offering. And this is where we are announcing Crown Jewel Insurance. So the overall process is called Crown Jewel Protector, but the insurance policy itself is called Crown Jewel Insurance. We think this is a game changer in the industry. Um, again, I spent 30 years as a broker. The last 
15 of it really focused on cyber, media, intellectual property, and technology-related risk, all kinds of different errors and omissions type of exposures. Um, and, you know, it was a constant struggle and a constant source of frustration for us on the brokerage side as well as the client side, but it was something that the markets were understandably concerned about trying to ensure when the valuation methodologies, at least in their minds, weren't there or weren't supportable. Um, and so, you know, that's how we're moving forward um, with developing this insurance program. To date, we have $50 million roughly of capacity. Um, could be more if we had a client who came to us tomorrow and said, we really need 75 million. Um, we haven't been tasked to do that yet. So you only know what you can do when you try to go do it. Um, and, but we're optimistic about where we are in the marketplace today. Um, as you can understand when you're developing any new product, uh, markets aren't jumping in with both feet right away and putting up $20 million of capacity each. So it'll take some time to get there. It takes a village, as they say. And if anybody's on the phone that's with the carrier, um, you know, we would love to chat with you about participating in this program. Um, certainly, we're not closed to any ideas around adding additional support to this endeavor. Um, we can ensure, for the moment, name and ensure up to 20 trade secret assets that we could, that would be considered the crown jewels of an organization. Um, we're not trying to cover every single trade secret that you have um, for a lot of different reasons, um, not the least of which is that it would just become cumbersome from an underwriting standpoint. And we may already be running into situations where companies have higher value when you add the fair market value of all their trade secrets together than the value we can get. We have a solution for that in terms of rating, but we, you know, we're tempering that against the amount of capacity we can get at the moment. So we've landed on 20 trade secrets for now. Um, they must be scheduled on the policy form, which makes sense. Um, and we also will be tracking those from a, um, from a security standpoint with the monitoring services that we're putting in place. The average rate uh, is somewhere between a 3 and 8% rate online, which I recognize is a relatively significant um, delta. But there are a lot of determining factors that go into, you know, we're sort of starting with a 5% rate online. And for those of you who are not in the insurance world, uh, the attorneys and others on the phone, that means 5% of the limit that you're purchasing, essentially. Um, we're starting with a 5% rate online, but we debit or credit that based on a lot of other factors um, that we talked about as part of the underwriting process. Um, there are three insuring agreements in the policy form that I want to walk through quickly. The first insuring agreement, for those of you that have done and placed a lot of cyber insurance, this will look very familiar, is the breach response and recovery expense coverage. So um, when, you, when you believe that you have a trade secret asset that's been compromised or when you find out that there may have been one by the, the monitoring technology that we're using, um, we will pull the trigger on the coverage and get X-Cyber involved in the forensics investigation as well as any um, part of the intelligence community that needs or should be involved in that investigation and invoke Marx and his team's help on the legal side to determine what we can do and whether or not um, we can file for an ex parte seizure order and some of the things that we talked about. So that's the stop the bleeding coverage, if you will, sort of the, figure out the source and scope of the attack, what happened, how it was exfiltrated from the system, whether it was a technology breach or otherwise. Um, you know, just a former employee or a disgruntled employee who made a bunch of copies of stuff and stuck them in their briefcase. Um, that's what that portion of the coverage pays for and, and brings the services to bear. If we are not able to successfully stop the bleeding and recapture the trade secret asset under insuring agreement A, that's when we move to insuring agreement B, which pays the fair market value of the asset as agreed up front using the valuations that we talked about with Bill earlier. And of course, the carrier and the insured would all have to agree on the fair market value of each of those assets so that everybody knows exactly what's covered. 
Um, and it's a very easy, should be an extremely easy settlement process, which is a huge hurdle for us. And we're thrilled to be able to say that we, we believe we've gotten to, you know, the agreement and understanding from the underwriters that if A isn't successful, we pay the fair market value. Um, there's no adjustment on whether or not they were really on target to hit those numbers, et cetera, et cetera. There are a couple of exceptions to that in the wording which we don't have time to go into right now, but it really is truly meant to be a very simplified claims adjustment process. And then ensuring agreement C, um, I think should make a lot of people happy and I think is a really cool coverage feature that you don't see very often in any insurance policy. And that is that we are going to provide coverage to seek damages and go after the perpetrator um, or the misappropriator of the trade secret asset, if assuming that under insuring agreement A, we know who's got it and where they went and what they're planning to do with it. Um, under insuring agreement C, even if the cause of the disclosure or theft is not covered, in other words, if it's not a security breach, but it is somebody who just stole paper documents, um, we will still, it, as long as the panel of experts, the three of us on the phone and the underwriters involved in this process, together with the technology firm, all agree that we are in pretty good shape based on the DTSA and other legal remedies that we have available to us. Um, to go after that third-party misappropriator, we will go after them and help seek damages even if the claim is otherwise not covered, which is a really unique feature and, again, could save clients millions of dollars on the back end. Um, they really have nothing to lose in this regard because, as Mark will talk about in just a second, the DTSA and some of the remedies covered under that um, allow for the payment of multiple damages, meaning that we might end up recovering more in the way of damages than the fair market value of the trade secret asset itself, because we might get something that feels and looks like punitive damages. And if so, we will keep a portion of that and the rest of the money would go back to the insured. So, um, you know, it's a really neat coverage feature that we're excited about. Um, now I'm going to turn it back over to Mark to quickly run through legislation and um, and litigation, and then um, we'll have five or so minutes to answer a couple questions. So the trade the trade secret owner now has um, all the tools that they need um, as a result of the enactment of the Defend Trade Secrets Act of, of 2016, uh, which was passed by the U.S. Senate 87 to 0 and by the House of Representatives 410 to 2. I, I worked on that for for three or four years. Uh, some of you may know that I wrote the Law Review article in 2008 that recommended the uh, ex parte seizure order uh, and a private civil cause of action. But the fact is now that here's the state of the law. 49 out of 50 states have the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, New York being the only state that does not. But, but now with the uh, Defend Trade Secrets Act of 2016, you have a federal cause of action. So you have the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, you have the Defend Trade Secrets Act of 2016, you have the Economic Espionage Act of 1996, which is a civil statute um, and now with the Defend Trade Secrets Act, but also is a criminal statute. But the point that we want to emphasize on increased damages is if you prove that there was a misappropriation of a trade secret and that that misappropriation was willful and malicious, that under the Uniform Trade Secrets Act and under the Defend Trade Secrets Act, you're entitled to increased uh, two times the amount of compensatory damages uh, as increased damages. And the courts have construed that to be if compensatory damages, for example, are 10 million and it was willful and malicious misappropriation, that's 20 million, two times compensatory, you add it together, it's $30 million. So in essence, you, you can obtain treble damages. And then you also have RICO. RICO has come alive now, the Racketeer Influence Corrupt Organizations Act, which uh, we've now had experience with over many, many years. It's, it's not the RICO that a lot of us remember at the beginning of our careers. RICO has scheduled, uh, under the new Defend Trade Secrets Act, they have scheduled uh, Section 1831, 
which is economic espionage, and Section 1832, which is the theft of trade secrets or domestic uh, trade secret theft, as predicate acts for purposes of RICO. And so you have you have 25 different acts defined in uh, Section 1831, and then 25 attempts to commit those acts, and another 25 to conspire to commit those acts. At 75 predicate acts you have to work from under 1831 or under 1832. What this does now is allow you to put together a complaint that has Uniform Trade Secrets Act violation, Defend Trade Secrets Act violation, RICO violations, and because the Defend Trade Secrets Act does not preempt common law causes of action, uh, the courts are starting to recognize you can add those back in too, such as uh, you know, conversion or others, uh, breach of the uh, fiduciary duty and whatever common law causes of action you want to add in into the complaint. And under RICO, it's it's a mandatory trouble damages. Uh, there is court uh, supervision over the increased damages in the UTSA and the Defend Trade Secret Act cases. Generally, the court follows uh, you know what the jury finds and returns as a verdict. The long and short of it is is that we have all the tools necessary, both in federal and state level, to, to deal uh, with uh, a situation of theft uh, of trade secrets and the mitigation efforts that, that Mary uh, described. <clears throat> I guess I also want to uh, uh, spend a moment on the six-factor litmus test. This is critical to understanding the power of the Trade Secret Examiner software platform. This is not a platform where you just enter in uh, subjective data. You, it, is, it is structured so that it captures the information asset as it scales on a one to five scale on the six factors. What is the six factor litmus test? The six factor litmus test is really uh, stood the test of time almost 200 years really. In 1939, when the original restatement of torts, when they addressed trade secret misappropriation for the first time, they looked to case law from the 19th century in order to formulate, uh, you know, e examples of what trade secrets were. And that six-factor test came out of the original 1939 restatement, again, based upon looking at 100 years of, of case law before that. And today is used as the litmus test to determine whether an alleged information asset qualifies as a trade secret act. Uh, and the factors are the extent to which the information is known outside the company. Factor two, the extent to which the information is known by employees and others involved in the company. Factor number three, the extent of measures taken by the company to guard the secrecy of the information. Factor four, the value of the information to the company and competitors. Factor five, the amount of time, effort, and money expended by the company in developing the information. And factor six, the ease of difficulty with which the information could be properly acquired or duplicated by others. It is an extremely valuable test. You run the, tra the alleged trade secret assets or the information assets through this six-factor litmus test. You score it. It provides a defendability factor, which you can then also calculate a security factor to determine whether you have adequate security. It is a very powerful tool that emulates what happens when you actually go in the court. Anybody who's actually gone in and tried a trade secret case, you're essentially marshalling and putting witnesses on the stand and attempting to introduce documents and evidence to address the six factors. Well, guess what? You can do all that ahead of time, way ahead of time. Uh, and have that scoring and have that uh, protection and organization of your trade secret assets before you ever have to go to court. And if you then have to go to court, you have all this evidence blockchained in the system. And so if you push the button, you're ready to go right into court and get the ex-party seizure order. So it's a critical part of the, uh, the software platform, the trade, trade secret asset management the platform. And finally, the EONA proofs, uh, the acronym, Existence, Ownership, Notice, and Access. These are requirements for the plaintiff in a trade secrets case. He has to be able to establish the existence of at least one trade secret, ownership of that trade secret, notice to the person that you're claiming has stolen it so that they were on notice that they, this information was a trade secret, and you have to show access, the EONA proofs. Within the existence, that's where you identify the trade secret. That's where the, 
the trade secret examiner six-factor analysis comes in. But you have to show existence, ownership, notice, and access. And guess what? All of that can be entered into the, the automated trade secret asset management system and blockchain. So once again, if you have a threat or actual theft of trade secret with a few pushes of buttons on your keyboard, you're ready to go in the, a court with the blockchain evidence of existence, ownership, notice, and access to the scheduled trade secret asset that's part of the uh, <clears throat> crown jewel insurance policy. Thanks, Mark. Um, that concludes our sort of planned remarks. We've got according to my clock here, six minutes left. We'll answer a couple of questions um, that are frequently asked, um, one, of, one of which um, came in just a minute ago as evidence that it is a frequently asked question. Um, and we, we've got a few others that we will, as I said, record a video response on and get that out to everybody and or post it here and on our uh, YouTube page. If you look at the page, before we move on, if you look at the page, the following slide has all of our social media information, uh, website information, and how to get in touch with us to ask for additional information, which, you know, obviously we would love to hear from you and love to help you and or your clients out um, as they struggle and grapple with how to, how to get insurance and protect their trade secrets appropriately. Um, and again, we really appreciate everyone's time. Um, I would like to um, open up with a question that um, seems to be fairly common, which is, um, what are the obligations, Mark, that, that a client has once a trade secret has been misappropriated? Can they just walk away from it and say, oh, well, it's not worth our time? Well, I mean, you, um, the, the client is the owner or the holder of the trade secret. If, the, if the, the holder or the owner of the trade secret decides to forfeit its intellectual property rights and that information asset, uh, they can at any time forfeit it, you know, publish it, uh, or fail, fail to take reasonable measures to protect it will result in a forfeiture or a destruction of that information asset as a trade secret. The courts are not going to protect something uh, that the, the the holder or the owner of the trade secret hasn't tried to protect. Um, and so that's why in all those definitions I reviewed, there's this requirement of taking reasonable measures under the circumstances to protect the the information as a trade secret. And that's that's critical. And uh, if you fail to take reasonable measures, uh, then your trade secret rights to that information asset will be vitiated as a matter of law. If you make one unprotected disclosure, to a third party without an obligation of confidentiality, you forfeit the, uh, the information as a trade secret asset. People don't realize that trade secret assets are very fragile uh, assets. And often many have just a short shelf life, but the fact of the matter is you have to take reasonable measures to protect it as a trade secret. Uh, in order to derive an economic or actual event, uh, economic advantage from the secrecy of the information. Right. Um, another uh, second question for you, Mark, is really a two-parter, and that is what a lot of people wonder what's going to happen or, you know, how we would be able to respond from an enforcement perspective if the trade secret asset was compromised or stolen by a foreign adversary, um, say the Chinese government, for example, or a company that appears to be sponsored by the Chinese government. And, and a second part to that question is, um, does our new trade agreement as a country help in the cooperation aspect of enforcement outside the United States and in particular with China? Well, on the second point, I've written an, I've written an article on that uh, or a LinkedIn post that I would encourage everyone to go back and look it up several weeks ago on the Chinese. Yes, there are, there are, the, there are um, procedures and provisions in that trade agreement to cooperate on intellectual uh, property issues. Um, RICO, RICO cause of action and extraterritorial jurisdiction under the uh, Defend Trade Secrets Act. Um, that extraterritorial provision sat within the Economic Espionage Act and, uh, it, uh, and no one really knew it existed because it was a criminal statute. 
but it's still there, and now it's a civil statute with the addition of the Defend Trade Secrets Act, and this opens up extraterritorial jurisdiction, and you and that's uh, 18 uh, U.S.C. Uh, section 1837, extraterritorial jurisdiction applies to conduct occurring outside the United States. Now you take that and couple it with the fact that that sections 1831 and 1832 provide predicate offenses now, and you bring that together, and you can build uh, an enterprise of criminal liability under RICO, which which would allow you to go all the way up as far as a foreign government. In fact, uh, there's foreign foreign instrumentality and foreign agent are defined terms under the Economic Espionage Act. RICO opens up third-party liability all the way up the chain to the government. And uh, this is very important because I think a lot of people lose sight of the fact that under the Uniform Trade Secrets Act and the Defense Trade Secrets Act, third-party liability is, is actually very limited. It's limited to just those persons who receive a trade secret under circumstances where they know or have reason to know that it's somebody else's trade secret and they shouldn't be using it you know, like receiving stolen property. But that's it. That's the that's the narrow scope of third-party liability. That's not the kind of uh, vista of third-party liability you need to attack foreign economic espionage. But we have those tools now. We have RICO, and we have extraterritorial jurisdiction under Section 1837. And so you can now go after the entire, uh, the entire chain of bad actors, you know, the equivalent of the godfather, the, 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 those who are making decisions and managing the foreign economic espionage, you can go after all that now um, by uh, using RICO cause of action and the recognition that Section 1837 applies those predicated offenses to extraterritorial uh, activities. Thank you. Um, so I'm, we're running out of time here. I wanted to answer one, one, ask one other question that I get a lot myself in closing, um, and that is um, that, that people tend to ask what types of industry and or company size are the target clients that we're going after? Um, and I think the answer is relatively easy in that we don't really have a size requirement in terms of revenues of the client. Although, because uh, really we're focused on the, you know, how many crown jewel trade secret assets they want to schedule under the policy form, and how much those are worth, you know, are to to a certain extent will be markets more and more comfortable, and as we see success under this program. But logistics and supply chain companies, manufacturers, chemical petrochemical companies, pharmaceutical companies, media and entertainment. If you think Game of Thrones um, wasn't something that was super valuable before the eighth season came out in terms of advertising revenue and all the other things that would have been uh, given up. But for, you know, all the hype around that, if it had been compromised, you know, that's a great example of something that people might not think of um, as, as a trade secret or something that you could cover under this type of insurance. Um, technology, life sciences, defense, which is going to be, um, frankly, one of the more expensive trade secrets to insure because it's, a, it's um, at the highest end of the threat level at the moment, together with aviation and auto, um, especially around autonomous vehicle technology. Um, those are going to be on the more expensive end. And then last but certainly not least, and another issue near and dear to my heart is green energy um, and or anything having to do with um, you know, bio you know, farming and things that are going to help improve um, our environment as it relates to um, climate change. Um, the other thing that I would just say is please think about this and, sh and spread the word with brokers and lawyers and clients who are in the private equity and venture capital space because that is one area, again, where um, VC or private equity firms are mandating to another company because of their trade secret assets um, right now, there is no insurance covering that underlying asset, the value of that asset, and this is well, that's exactly what this product is designed to do. And um, with that, I'm afraid we're out of time, but again, I really appreciate everybody um, tuning in, listening today. This will be available for replay. We'll post it on um, this um, Crowdcast website, I believe, 
and we're also going to put it up on YouTube. Please follow Crown Jewel Insurance on LinkedIn as well. We also have a Twitter account and we'll be posting this video and have several other things up on our YouTube channel. Links in the description.